They are not there upholding their constitutional oaths, and in fact, they are trashing them. And when you actually look at some of the very cold, I would say Marxist beliefs behind these people that seem to animate them, they are um, deceiving us as to who they really are, and they are trying to enact their own visions of, 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 of what the polity should be, irrespective of these oaths and, and irrespective of the people's will. Is it possible that communist ideology has infiltrated America's intelligence agencies? After looking into key figures involved in the Spygate scandal, what information did Diana West uncover about their beliefs? And how is Donald Trump a counter-revolutionary president in West's view? This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kellek. In this episode, we'll sit down with Diana West, a journalist and author of The Red Thread, a search for ideological drivers inside the anti-Trump conspiracy. Diana West, uh, wonderful to have you on American Thought Leaders. Oh, wonderful to be here, Jan. What, what motivated you to try to find this, this sort of common ideological thread? How did this happen? Well, that's a really good question because there was one thing, and it had to do with looking at the behaviors, the actions we were starting to learn about, say, a couple of years ago on the part of these senior officials in Washington that certainly, it may be argued, some of them are seditious. I mean, really serious actions against the uh, rule of law in their efforts to take down this presidency, the campaign, uh, undermine the transition, and, and it's just gone on and on. And I was just trying to get a sense of why they were so angry, why they were taking these, these resorting to these measures when America is known for the peaceful transition of power. Right. And normally when one party goes out of power, the other party comes in and the one that's out of power starts building their campaign for next time and the power will change every two to four years, six years, eight years at the most, but the pendulum swings right. and normally these kinds of people will just wait till next time. And so we didn't see that. We saw all kinds of plotting going on that we were learning about, all kinds of just absolutely terrifying uses of our security agencies, the FBI, the CIA, and so on. So I would wondered, who are these people? Why are they doing this? Why are they risking everything? Because of course, if they are caught, and you know this is still an open question, yes. if they are caught, they can lose everything, including their freedom, including certainly their pensions, including their reputation. So what was driving them? This was not normal American behavior. And this becomes a very difficult question to answer when you're looking at career public officials, people okay. who um, have tremendous resumes, uh, they head the FBI, they head the CIA, they work in the Justice Department. You really can't get very far outside of their public persona. In 2017, it was actually December, we had a real break in the whole story, and that was by James Rosen. Okay. Who was then with Fox News, and he wrote about this very interesting couple, Bruce and Nellie Orr. Bruce Orr being the high ranking Justice Department official who was a liaison between Christopher Steele and the justice world, yes. as we learned. And his wife Nellie, who worked for Glenn Simpson at Fusion GPS, the shop that created the Steele dossier. Well, Nellie, it turned out, had been an academic. She was a professor in the 1990s. And that meant that there were going to be writings, publicly available writings, book reviews, for example, uh, a PhD thesis, and so on, that I could at least look at to try to get a better sense of who she was, is. And indeed, it turns out she is a Russia expert. She speaks the language. She taught the subject. She got a PhD in it in history uh, at Stanford and after Harvard. And she studied in the Soviet Union. Uh, when it was still the Soviet Union. And I ended up putting together in the red thread kind of an ideological profile of Nellie Orr. She's my first case in which I did learn, I did learn that she had a very soft spot, believe it or not, for the regime of Joseph Stalin. Fascinating. Terrifying. <laughs> but it, it is, it is a, uh, something where she talked about um, kind of on the one hand and on the other hand. In other words, she would talk about the terror, this is a quote, the terror and excitement 
of the Stalin era. She was talking about the frustration in a book review of trying to teach about this era to her students at Vassar okay. in the 1990s. Terror, I can understand. Excitement. So you look a little further and you find that she similarly uh, applauded Stalin for trying to build a legal structure. This is what she called the agonizing paradox of Stalin's era, trying to build a legal, a legal structure on the one hand and yet executing innocent civilians on the other hand. I mean, this is the kind of um, attitude, it's kind of a, a, a moral equivalent attitude, really, right. when you're looking at this bloodthirsty regime that killed millions and millions of people. The legal structure was a sham if you're killing, executing innocent sure. civilians, of course, but this this is this was this was very clearly uh, a theme of her writings, and indeed, including in her PhD thesis. And I learned that she followed a school of um, history in American uh, American academia known as revisionism. It is a revisionism. There have been a number, but okay. it was one that came about in the '60s and '70s that was essentially promoted by. Uh, straight up Marxists um, and the new left, what we used to call the new left in this country, which really wasn't much different from the old left. It was usually their children, um, but they they took over really the departments on the college campuses, and they are a school that writes about itself and has its stars and so on. And she very clearly followed in this school. Those people are the people she uh, thanks, who are essentially her mentors, people she studied at Harvard and so on. So it became pretty clear that there was a red thread, if you will, here in terms of a uh, openness to uh, communist ideology as it was put into practice. And a willingness to Union. see someone like Stalin, who we know his history, you know, right. extremely well right. in this sort of positive, apologetic light. Yes, yeah. shocking. Yeah, absolutely shocking. I mean, so she was sort of case number one, and and mm -hmm. you know it goes on from there. But that kind of gives you a flavor of what I was, what I was finding with Nellie Orr. Um, it always intrigued me. She does have a CIA credential. She worked for their open source uh, shop, so we know she had a CIA connection. Interesting. Um, we also know uh, that she took out a ham radio operators license in the spring of 2016. Oh, right. So you're thinking, who's she talking to? Who's she talking to? Yeah. We, don't know the, we don't know the answers to these questions, but right. she becomes a very interesting figure and very important in this entire well, ex Extremely, movement. for multiple reasons, right? I mean, if you believe Lee Smith, you know, she's very uh, instrumental, actually, yes. in the creation of the Steele dossier in the first place. Um, and now that we have, you know, the IG report that has come out fairly recently, it's... Yes auspicious that we're having this yes. interview. <laughs> Actually, so we, we know a lot more about how, let's say, wrong or false the Steele dossier was through right. and through. Right, garbage. Right, right, right. right. That, that, that's, <laughs> right. A good, that's a good word, right? It's been used. Um, so, okay, well, so yeah. you also looked at Christopher Steele yes. in the book. Yes. And so, so what, what did you find? I mean, well, I, I know a little bit, but but tell tell me. Yes, well, it's it, he seemed like the next person to try to crack a little bit mm -hmm. into the shell of because essentially, if she had a little CIA connection, which has not really been fully disclosed, in other words, we don't really know if she knows John Brennan from her past or what have you, um, another person in this group, uh, Christopher Steele, as a former intelligence officer for the British is almost her opposite number at Fusion GPS. And his, it's his name, obviously, on the dossier. And there's very little about him as an intelligence officer, given that is not a very public uh, yes, profession. Yes, of course. But when he burst on the scene, the British press were looking at him. And one of the things, first things that came out, he was a very prominent student at Cambridge in the 1980s. Uh, around the same age as Nellie Orr, also went, graduated in the 1980s. Um, and, and Christopher Steele was the head of the very storied Cambridge Debating Society, the Cambridge Union. Um, I believe at the same time, the new Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, was the head of the Oxford Union. Okay. Uh, so you see the kind of people these are. And when Christopher Steele was this prominent Cambridge student, he was known, and this is in a history of the Cambridge Union, he was known as a confirmed socialist. Wow. Wow, right. exactly. And when you look at that, that was twinned with some reporting um, by the Daily Mail that stated that he was also somebody who had CND credentials. 
Mm -hmm. CND what? goes <laughs> back to that same period. CND was Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. Right. It was essentially a Marxist front group uh, that was very much in sync with Soviet Union foreign policy goals to remove um, American nuclear weapons from, from Europe. And they were uh, riddled with, with actual Marxists. Um, some think there was also support from the Soviet Union of the whole group. Certainly that also included a number of very sincere, peaceable people who were hoping to do right by the world. Um, but this would be a place where Christopher Steele had some involvement. We don't know the extent of it. But interesting, because it certainly is a hard left type of credential. And the fact that he left Cambridge and was hired then by MI6, and then posted in Moscow with these kinds of politics is just another one of these shocking happen, happenings that we're seeing replicated everywhere, which tells you a lot about MI6. You would think they might have learned they had a number of Soviet agents out of Cambridge, the very famous Cambridge Five, yes. for example. So you'd think they'd be more careful. But what is their culture? We, you know, we can learn a little bit about that from this kind of a hire. Um, Christopher Steele also was known to others with, you know, very edgy in terms of his politics. He has the distinction of bringing in the first uh, PLO representative to the Cambridge Uni Union. And this was a time when the United States and Israel still considered the Palestinian movement um, to be a terrorist organization, I mean, officially. So this was a big deal at that time to essentially normalize uh, that particular group um, with that kind of an invit uh, very prestigious invitation. So you see where his politics, where his politics are. I always wondered, you know, given when Donald Trump burst on the scene in the spring of 2016 with his foreign policy speech, he st spoke specifically about essentially revamping Americans' nuclear arsenal. Yes. I also wondered if that perhaps might have given Christopher Steele added reason to try to oppose him. You know, we don't know. We don't know where Christopher Steele's politics are on that particular point, but given his animus against Donald Trump, I wouldn't be surprised to learn that he still had those same feelings. When reading the book, yeah. you um, you know, there's all these kind of specific specific items of information that you've managed to dig up, and yes. dig out. It's 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 remarkable, um, and you get this kind of feeling of you know, it, it, there is this just kind of dominating ideology here and it's very and it's a, yes. it's a left ideology right this is I think what you're showing yes um, and this particularly comes out in you know someone who's actually been in the news again front and center of course the former director of the FBI yes. Mr. Comey yes um, and that what, what you found what you found around Comey is again you know fascinating I mean there's some of it is known and some of it is uh, I guess less known. I mean, yes. can you sure, expand a little bit here? Because yes. this is, I think this this seems like the, one of the deepest dives you do, right? Yes, well, yeah. it, thanks to Comey's own writings and right. public statements, because all of this is open source, obviously, and it's you know mainly their own, their own words um, that I'm looking at or reports about them. So I think that one way to think of them helpfully is really anti-democratic, small d, anti-democratic, anti-election, <laughs> Anti the people. I mean, this is the great irony of of the left, I suppose. But but, when we but look well at, meaning. I mean, this is. I don't know. You know okay. I can't really speak to intent. Okay. You know, certainly there are well meaning people in the same general movement, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but I but in terms of intent by James Comey, I, I I couldn't speak to it. I have to sort of look at um, for this for this exercise. I'm just looking at trying to understand what he believes, and. The first clue comes from an interview he gave in 2003. And this was with New York Magazine. And he was just about to be elevated from, he was working um, in the Southern District of New York as a federal prosecutor. And he was just about to be elevated to be the number two man at the Justice Department under George W. Bush. Okay. J uh, John Ashcroft was the mm -hmm. Attorney General. And the uh, New York Magazine writer thought it was a very strange pairing because Comey, even though he was considered to be a Republican, was kind of an edgy punk rock type, um, whereas John Ashcroft was known as a uh, very, you know, a conservative yes. Christian, yes. constitutional. Um, very Christian. Very, yeah. yes, yeah. Yeah. And, and criticized for this and um, by the media, I should mm -hmm. say. 
But Comey um, was uh, telling this reporter, kind of a giddy interview, and I suspect, because he knew he was going to be getting this phone call confirming his appointment, he, the reporter thought he was just laughing all the time, and maybe because he was about to join this uh, uh, rarefied <laughs> ranks of power in the Justice Department. But anyway, he told the reporter that when he was in college, he had been a communist and that he didn't really know what his politics were. This would be about 20 years later. Mm -hmm. But um, whatever they were, you know, he was different, I suppose, but he hadn't really figured it out yet, which I thought was an interesting statement. Not exactly a, um, a fire-breathing anti-communist, to be sure, but leave it there. Um, so I thought, well, what can we learn about the period where he was a communist? And William and Mary, his alma mater, uh, has posted online, very helpfully, their uh, senior papers by their students. Okay. And so I was able to find John Comey's uh, senior thesis, which was about his lifelong mentor. This is somebody very important to him to this day, the uh, theologian Reinhold Niebuhr, and Jerry Falwell was the other subject of this paper, Jerry Falwell being the leader, the founder of the Moral Majority. and. Comey was juxtaposing their views of the Christian in politics. Okay. So it's an interesting paper. Mm -hmm. And Co um, Jerry Falwell's view was that you should take Christian morality into the political realm and follow the Ten Commandments, basically. Mm -hmm. And Reinhold Niebuhr was that you should ditch your Christian teachings and work for his definition of justice, which was essentially a very coercive redistribution of power and wealth, which sounds very Marxist. Yes. Well, Reinhold Niebuhr was very Marxist, so it would appeal to a young James Comey, the communist. Reinhold Niebuhr was somebody who um, was a member of the Socialist Party. Uh, he lobbied very heavily for the United States to recognize the Soviet Union in the 1930s. He belonged to numerous communist front groups. Um, uh, 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 judged that way by the Attorney General under Roosevelt. These were co official communist front groups, according to the Attorney General. And Reinhold Niebuhr had very high-ranking positions with them. Um, he, in that period, he actually advocated the use of force to change our social order. There's a headline I found from the 1930s where he'd gone to a college campus. This is Reinhold Niebuhr. And the reason I even bring this up is this was not just a youthful fl flirtation of James Comey, because Comey, to this day, when he's asked who his influences are, the very first one is Reinhold Niebuhr. Right. He even notes the first two books that were most important to him coming from the same most militant period of Niebuhr's life, the 1930s, where Niebuhr really was talking about revolution as a possibility, possibly justified. And the kinds of things that Comey writes about in his thesis um, are chilling in light of his rising to the heights of our justice system and the FBI. Right. He basically says that, um, that there are position times when an evil, an evil action, this is a paraphrase, but very close, an action may be evil, but not necessarily immoral, given okay. the circumstances. So this is where you start to see Comey, the actor who will, for example, decide not to uh, take it on himself to even uh, take the role of the attorney general to decide not to indict Hillary Clinton, for example, out of the circumstances. I mean, this is where you start seeing the ends justify the means, um, the uh, notion that he knows what the higher good is. Okay. Um, he talks about the, uh, again, distilling Niebuhr, that the Christian in politics must leave his Christian beliefs when he is actually acting in politics and must be willing to sin in the name of justice. This is another one of Comey's beliefs from this senior thesis. And again, we might say, well, he's 22 years old. However, uh, you know, this, this Niebuhr uh, affinity still is something he, he is the first to tell you about. So I think it's valid to explore Niebuhr's beliefs. And also the fact that Niebuhr, um, Niebuhr taught Comey's professor at William & Mary, right. as did a Frankfurt School member that Niebuhr taught with, Paul Tillich. That becomes interesting when you're doing this sort of notion of a red thread, when you look at a very young Hillary Clinton, who really was, you know, we might say, 
radicalized um, in her youth by her youth minister, her Methodist youth ministry. It's a well-known story that I think Barbara Olson first uh, wrote about years ago. Um, and this youth minister by the name of Jones was assigning his charges, Reinhold Niebuhr and Paul Tillich. So we're seeing the same influences. Same intellectual influences. Same intellectual influences. And this is essentially what the book tries to do, is to try to go where um, intellectual biography lies. Because I think we miss a lot when we don't study the motivations and study the, the um, influences on these very important people whose policy making reflect these early and very serious, you know, these are serious people. You know, Comey, well, Clinton, and so I mean, on. Top of the power structure right. in America. Right, and they they share these same kinds of early uh, formative influences and carry them through. I believe to this day. I think you can certainly make that case. So you have this really interesting chapter in your book. Uh, I think it's a bouquet for, a bouquet for Putin. Yes. T t tell me about what you found uh, with respect in, in this chapter. Yes. Yeah. Well. That particular chapter refers to a, a quotation from Nancy Pelosi, mm -hmm. who actually was criticizing the, at that moment, about to be released four page memo from Devin Nunes's intelligence committee. What's known as the Nunes memo now? Yes, the yeah. Nunes memo, four pages. And I will just never forget living through that period. This would have been early, uh, early 2018. Mm -hmm. And this was a matter for Donald Trump to decide. It was classified, this, this particular memo. And the furor in Washington, I'm not even sure if impeachment equals it. It was that over the top, okay. just because this was one document. And you heard from Nancy Pelosi, you heard from John McCain, you heard from all of never Trump, all of the left, all of the Democrats, all of the punditocracy, if you will, on, on cable news, railing against the p p possible release of this particular document as the end of the republic, not just the end of the republic, but something that would aid Vladimir Putin, that could only help Vladimir Putin. And this is when you saw this notion that the, uh, the FBI and the Justice Department and the CIA were untouchable and could not be criticized, which was a fascinating switch coming from the left, where if we go back a couple of decades, they were always fighting the FBI and the CIA and, and these power structures. Well, it's also, and it's also the role of media, ostensibly, to, you know, to fight to, the, to the, the, truth, the to institutions power of power. So exactly. Right, right, right. It's so true. And, and you know, now they were essentially their spokesmen and women for um, secrecy, for preventing the people from making up our own mind um, for reading this memo that was, you know, created on our dime and in order to get to the bottom of what was going on by our duly elected officials. And you even had John McCain uh, begging for Robert Mueller to be the only real official looking at this and actually calling for elected officials to stop looking at all of these things through the lens of politics as if getting to the bottom of it was only a political um, type of, uh, he called it a partisan sideshow, which is truly stunning because when it was released, and this was Donald Trump's declassification, it comes out, we all could not wait to read it. I mean, it was probably even more than any of these giant reports. It was the big news. Four succinct pages, and we got the whole thing. We got the entire mechanism by which the FBI and the Justice Department subverted the process by which they would uh, uh, seek a warrant from the FISA court to spy on Carter Page and the wider Trump campaign. It's all in that memo. The relationship of Bruce and Nellie Orr, Christopher Steele, the, the, the um, creation of the dossier, the, the mechanism after Christopher Steele was no longer working with the FBI, you know, how he continued to work through the Orrs and so on. It's all in there in four pages. And I looked at the uh, the giant FISA report, which recently came out from the IG, which I have, I you know don't pretend to have read it all yet, but I looked at it, and basically, it's it's a giant elaboration on what right. came out of that four-page memo. When you realize that the Nunes memo was vindicated in in every particular, and you look back at this group of of politicians, of media, 
of the uh, various officials inside the Justice Department who were preventing this from being declassified, you know, it's a presidential order that declassified it, you have to start wondering what they believe, what their purpose was in preventing the people from seeing this, this truly chilling information about the, the abuse of the security uh, state. And I think that our only conclusion has to be is that they are against the people knowing what they're doing. They're against the, um, uh, uh, the democratic process, truly. They're against the duly elected officials carrying out their constitutional responsibilities. And their allegiance is to the security state. And that is a chilling proposition. But I, I really believe it's one we have to face. So when we get to this notion that the, the FBI made 17 errors, yes, errors, and that they made sloppiness, according to James Comey, he was wrong, they were sloppy. I mean, this becomes, this becomes laughable, and you really wonder, how dumb do they think we are? I mean, this, you have to connect it to this effort to save their, their, their perfidy from exposure. And, I, and one thing I learned, I, I wrote an earlier book called American Betrayal, and I learned no longer to see the world, really, these conflicts between the free world and the communist world, or Democrat and Republican. I learned to look at things between who wants to bring things into the open and who is trying to cover them up. Hmm. And you no longer see party divisions. You no longer even see divisions in terms of free world, communist world. It, it, there are um, people um, who want the truth to come out and let the people decide, and there are those that wish to, wish to withhold it from the people and never let the people have a role. So it's very interesting. You know, it makes me think of a couple of things. One is, yeah. you know, uh, uh, Glenn Greenwald, who's been one of the people that's been following this whole, let's call it the Russia collusion hoax. I think we yeah. can call it that fairly. Sure. It's a lot less Capital debatable letters. than yeah. it was even, you know, a, a, a few months ago. And sure. honestly, you know, very obviously has very left wing politics, but is absolutely anti-secrecy right. in his in his ideological yeah. respect so it's interesting how you know th th exactly what you're saying that there's this sort of commonality around there's more conservative and more uh, liberal uh, uh, folks that are all let's say anti-secrecy and want right. disclosure ir irrespective of where it falls because that's right. what's important versus this you know people on both sides of the aisle so to speak very happy to keep things under wraps yes. for, for whatever reason Yes, right. generally having to do with yeah. preserving power. Okay. And, and, well, I think that's true. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, because, you know, information, controlling information, I mean, this goes certainly to, you know, to Orwell and, and the, the notion of controlling the narrative. He talked about controlling the present to control the past and controlling the past to control right. the future very famously. It's really true. And, you know, this is something that above politics and above this particular horrendous episode in our history, this is about control of what we know and what we believe and how we can be manipulated based on those things. The other thing that, that really struck me with what yeah. you said, I think it reminded me of something Horowitz said in testimony, because I don't think yeah. this was in the report, but he said that um, what he found is kind of on the spectrum, this is a paraphrase too, yeah. on one end gross negligence, on the other side, intentionality, and he, yeah. but he isn't. You know, he's not making a judgment yeah. as to where it lands. Like you make, I think he was like, you make your judgment, right? Right. But it's somewhere as in that. Should. It's somewhere yes. in that realm, mm -hmm. which is, you know, I think of it actually quite a powerful statement. It is when you, yeah. So it really is, and and it, again, I think that is another reason that trying to examine what these people truly believe, what animates them to go into public life and not not sell insurance or, or build cabinets or, you know, um, teach, well, teaching actually is a very powerful uh, a profession as well in these same political terms, but, you know, what drove them to spend their careers in the corridors of power? It certainly does not, I mean, I think it's very fair to say they are not there upholding their constitutional oaths, and in fact, they are trashing them. And when you actually look at some of the very cold, I would say Marxist, beliefs behind these people that seem to animate them, they are um, deceiving us as to who they really are, and they are trying to enact their own visions of, 
of, of, of what the polity should be, irrespective of these oaths and, and irrespective of the people's will. And the arrogance on display is really only one of the manifestations of this. It's certainly something most people can see. Most people have noticed this about James Comey, for example, on, on both sides. Right. Um, but this, this, what does this speak to? And it is this kind of on fire, true believer of of doing, uh, you know, bringing love and justice as defined by Reinhold Niebuhr, which comes out of a very sort of Marxist bent, doing love and justice on the people, which requires coercion by the state. And it's frightening because mm. these are the kinds of people who are not reined in by a traditional kind of morality, going back to Comey's uh, dismissal of Falwell, for example. Um, they are unleashed by their amorality. And it's scary when they have the levers of power. This aspect of, of their lives is something that the media in particular and, and politicians shy away from. They really don't want to go there. And it, it interests me because, for example, I did a, a brief interview with Sean Hannity earlier mm -hmm. in the year. And we did get out there that Comey had uh, been a communist, that John Brennan had voted communist. And there wasn't much time for much more. That's yeah. another character that features. Oh, that we didn't features, talk about Brennan. That, that right. I just dropped that in there. Right. Strongly uh, uh, in the book and also is, you know, openly saying he's a communist, yes. right? Yes. I mean, that's, yeah. Almost as a recruiting tool because the time he, let me just, one, one thing, the, the point I was just going to make was this, these little factoids, which have so much more, you know, to, to discuss as we're doing, we could go on all day. Mm -hmm. um, it went wild on social media after that interview. But unfortunately, there was no follow on in terms of saying, well, what else can we learn about them? Mm -hmm. I think people are genuinely interested and want that missing X factor to, to explain why they made these mistakes, basically mistakes, in quotation marks. Um, but speaking to Brennan, yes, he's another important player here. He too wrote a master's thesis, which is publicly, well, uh, this would have been brought forward by, I think it was Charles Johnson uploaded this to uh, for the Daily Caller, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. John Brennan's master's thesis back in the day at University of Texas. And um, it is not as clear. Comey's is better written. You know, if we're looking for command and control, I don't know if that speaks to uh, one or the other, but Comey was was better writer. John Brennan, very fuzzy. I mean, you can see it in his tweets. Um, but he, uh, he wrote a, a paper uh, about human rights in, in Egypt. And basically, he is rather favorably disposed toward redistribution of, of land under Nasser. And he is sort of upset about, at the time, um, this would have been Sadat's time when he was writing, going more toward a free market or more toward a capitalist system. Right. You can read that into it, but he too, in you know this context, I'm not saying it's the same context, but he talks about democracy as a process, and because it's a process, there are times where you can essentially, um, I'm paraphrasing, you can essentially uh, ignore due process. Hmm. In if you are looking at expanding democracy, again, what is the definition thereof? But not to put too fine a point on it, because he was writing about the period and yes. Egypt, but he was also rather uh, concerning given his own roles and his own behaviors, if that really was his attitude at the time, and I think it was. He, he again saw, I believe, I would make the argument he saw the levers of power as not things to treat with deference, but things to use. And I think that unites a number of these people that are doing things we find so terribly alarming. Um, the more we find out about them, they are not constrained by their constitutional constraints. They are emboldened by their power. So, Diana, there's this yeah. moment in the book that you describe where uh, uh, Brennan is going to do his yes. polygraph, basically, yes. and, and to, you know, he's applying for work, I believe, yes. at the CIA, right? Or, or is it? A, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So absolutely, it's so, just before his admission. He, yeah. he was moving along the job process. And this is actually Brennan's story. He told this story. It's so interesting. He told this story. In, he told this story in September 2016. Okay. To a group. Uh, it was essentially a diversity type um, 
conference or, or a meeting where he, I believe, was telling the story in order to encourage leftists to apply to the CIA. He was essentially using that kind of diversity as a, an example of, look, I got in the CIA, you can too. I really think that was what was driving this mm -hmm. story, because you wonder, why would he bring this up? But think of September 2016, we are assuming Hillary Clinton is going to be president. I believe he was believed to uh, be the person who would have continued at the CIA in a Clinton administration. Mm -hmm. So you could look at it as a jobs fair <laughs> pitch. Um, and he talks about going to the, uh, for his polygraph, his lie detector test, and having this sort of moment where he realized, I better tell the truth because the machine will record if I lie, and they said the question becomes, um, do you have any association with a group that uh, wants to overthrow the United States, something like that? And he said simply that, yes, in 1976, he voted for Gus Hall, longtime Communist Party USA leader, um, convicted by the Smith Act of trying to overthrow the country, he went on the lam, he served time, I mean, a convicted revolutionary, basically. And John Brennan voted for him in 1976. And the thing that's interesting to me about his anecdote is he doesn't really go farther than that. In other words, he is still admitted to the CIA having made this admission in 1980. So it isn't even like, again, we can say, oh, well, long time youthful um, naivete. No, it's a few years later. He doesn't mention whether he was asked any other questions. In other words, did he? have a follow-up question, and I mean, that becomes kind of an interesting attitude to explore at the CIA when you think of Christopher Steele, the confirmed socialist. Yes, with MI6. Picked up by MI6, John Brennan, a communist sympathizer being hired by the CIA. I mean, what does that say about our organizations right then and there, long before Barack Obama becomes president, of course? So that was, that was essentially the anecdote. In 1980, um, you know, Angela Davis was running on that ticket. Um, you know, a Politburo member of the American Communist Party. And the thing that was kind of shocking to me, it's just a tiny little detail, but I thought it was kind of interesting, which is John Brennan's master's thesis advisor wrote a book on revolutions. And that book was owned by Angela Davis and was in a book bag that was used to smuggle guns into the courtroom that she owned that were used in this horrendous episode in the early 1970s when her her friends, her boyfriends, were on trial on this conspiracy kidnap murder trial. And indeed, the judge was kidnapped and killed in this episode. Anyway, it's just kind of a strange happenstance that John Brennan's professor's book on revolutions was in, present there. Uh, you know, these people, they, they do seem to sort of find each other through the generations and through the, I don't know, through the episodes. It's just a strange little detail, but that's the kind of thing you find when you start looking for whatever it's worth. We have Angela Davis speaking at the very famous Women's March after Trump's inauguration, remember? Who's proud of his daughters and wife going to that? James Comey. So we have an FBI director who thinks it's great that a march that celebrates Angela Davis has his family members there. They all voted for Hillary Clinton. I mean, these are the kinds of people who have come to the top of our security agencies, which once upon a time were actually almost in business to fight against communist subversion at home and abroad. So think about that, what that says about where the, rev the, the 180 degree revolution here well, in ideology. Know, what's, what's really fascinating about the book is it let, even let's say that people's you know thoughts have changed a lot. Let's say we don't. Let's say these were you know youth. A lot of people flirted with sure. with leftism in in their youth, but maybe changed their mind after. I've, I've come across countless oh, people in this, in this sort of realm, right? Sure. But um, what, what's what's fascinating about like what comes through in in the book is that there's just this persistent. Maybe, like you said, authoritarian red. Yeah. red thread. I guess that's the, that's the name. Yeah. Um, even if it shifted from maybe a, a more revolutionary type ideology to a more you know, more subtle, it's still very, very left leaning. Still very, yeah. uh, you know, control oriented. Still very. It's, it, 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 that well, that it's, is fascinating. You, yeah, you have Brennan morphs. and Comey at the same time, right. at the top of. You know, Terrifying these when you think about it. Incredibly powerful yeah. agencies right. that that you know can you know do you know 
anything. I mean, it's, it's to it's, anyone, yeah. including the president of the United States. I mean, right. this is. But think about Comey in 2018 or whenever it was. This would have been 2017. Pr speaking with pride about his family going to this march that celebrated Angela Davis, who is still exactly what she always was. She's not changed a bit. She's still trying to bring down the man, the system, still with the movement. You know, this is her rhetoric. Right. That's current time. You know, that's, that's our former FBI director. So these things do persist. And what, what has gone is, is most Americans, indeed, in, including in our security agencies, our, our counterintelligence world, any concept that there can be an enemy ideology. There's no, there's no conception that such a thing should be concerning. And that, to me, is very interesting. I actually write a little bit about that, because one thing that was said when the Soviet Union went, to, went dissolved, you had some very interesting, well, many very interesting things happening. One of them was one of the top um, ideologists of the Soviet Union, who actually was in charge of their thinking, their, their understanding of America and Canada, was a man named Arbatov. Mm -hmm. And he actually did kind of a tour of America where he was discussing this notion of taking away our concept of an enemy. This is the early 90s. Okay. It's a really interesting concept. And, you know, people in the context of the day saw it in terms of this supposedly joyous ending of the Cold War, right, which right. was a very deceptive moment in our time um, in general terms, which we could, you know, have another conversation about, of course. But just thinking about that, that thought, we don't have any concept of an enemy. You know, moral relativism, if you want to call it that, is so deeply imbued that there is no ideology, including voting communists, that can bar you from uh, joining our most powerful intelligence agency, having voted communist. And when you think about that, that agency was essentially stood up to fight communism. And, and rise to the top of it. And rise to control it. Right. And to know all of its secrets. I mean, that man, whether he continues to have, I don't know what his status of his clearance is. I know President Trump didn't want him to continue with the clearance, but I gather he may still have it. But think about what he knows and what lots of people like him know. I mean, this is the thing. It's not just one person. This is a, a um, we've had this, this kind of, uh, sub I would call it subversion for de generations. So there are, there are hundreds, thousands of people over the generations who have replicated themselves at the Justice Department, in the CIA, now in the FBI. The FBI may have been the last to fall, I don't know. It seems like it was holding the line longer than some of the others. The swamp goes back generations, and it really speaks to this notion of, of these kinds of what I would call subversives, having entered the government um, in legions in the FDR administration after recognition of the Soviet Union. And this is something I wrote about quite a lot in American Betrayal, trying to understand this, because when you get to that post-World War II period, this is where I think you have the first real systematic attempt by the American people, by their elected representatives in both houses, the Senate, the Congress, Democrats, and Republicans, trying to understand what I think of as the swamp, the early, the early uh, manifestation of the swamp, this communist subversion that we saw investigated mm -hmm. on Capitol Hill, um, right. at Senator great cost. McCarthy. Senator McCarthy yeah. is, is certainly the most famous of these investigators, but there were numerous committee heads, numerous committees looking at this. There, I read one account in the New York Times that actually said they were doing so many investigations they were running out of rooms because so much had gone on unattended for this really uh, multiple administrations, Roosevelt to Truman, you know, 16 years. Um, before uh, uh, anyone even started looking. And this came to us, however, this got twisted into the Red Scare, McCarthyism being the great sin of American politics. Um, Red's under the bed. You're paranoid if you even think this is a true thing. And yet, the evidence as we know it today vindicates this effort. It was difficult. It, People lost their careers. They lost their lives. I mean, they lost everything. Um, this, this, you know, Senator McCarthy being the most famous representative of this and most successful. Mm -hmm. This, this will shock many viewers. He actually was quite successful in what he was trying to do, which was uncover communists and pro-communists on the federal payroll. 
I mean, this was not a matter of trying to stop communism or outlaw it or anything else. It was a matter of trying to keep communists off the federal payroll, particularly in sensitive uh, pl installations or d agencies such as the State Department, the defense world. This is what he was about, and he was demonized to a point of you know, destruction. And I would say that in that round, uh, maybe 10 years or less, five years, the McCarthy period was very short. He was only a chairman for less than two years, but he had, say, four years when he was looking at this. The period starts maybe with 1947, 48, goes maybe to his censure a little after. Less than a decade, really, when they were seriously on the case, they lost. The, the anti-communists lost. The swamp won. And I would say that we see the swamp sort of revealed by the advent of Trump, who I would argue is the most innately anti-communist president uh, perhaps that we've ever had. Certainly he is a colossal counter-revolutionary figure attempting to do something that really hadn't been tried before in the fight against domestic communism, and that really was um, reinstating the nation state which is the bulwark against communism. Communism being an internationalist yes. movement, dissolving the nation state, going toward a global, globalist type one world government, all of those things. When you start reinstating borders, homegrown manufacturing, control over your immigration policy, I mean, the, the Trump agenda was counter-revolutionary because he was trying to, re, he is trying to rebuild the nation state. And that is why I think you see these people come out of the woodwork, because they've been there for generations replicating themselves. Um, they come out of the woodwork, you know, hammer and tong, and doing all these outrageous, sloppy, I argue, seditious things, because he represents this mortal threat to this progressive project, which really has not seen much in the way of interruption at home since it began in earnest, I would say, at the end of World War II. And I would just say, consider the global structure that we've sort of been living in for a long time. It began at the end of World War II with two very important institute, institutions, namely the United Nations and the, in, the INF, yes. um, both of which were brought into existence by two Soviet agents who worked very high in the United States government. Alger Hiss from the State Department, he, he's essentially a midwife of the United Nations and he was the first uh, Secretary General. Yeah. Well, he ran the first yeah. uh, convocation in San Francisco. And Harry Dexter White, who had risen to be number two in the Treasury Department under FDR. And he, even though he was, Truman was warned, Truman appointed him to head this first sort of global economy institution, this first global bank. Well, that's something we don't usually think of when we talk about preserving, quote, the liberal world order that Trump was said to threaten, etc. I mean, these are facts. They're historical facts, confirmed, reconfirmed, confirmed again. And yet, again, because we shy away from this notion of ideology and the idea that we could have a mortal enemy that is ideological, that is anti-constitutional, anti-democratic, small d, um, we have been deprived of this notion of an enemy, and so we have just sort of moved in this direction for all these decades until Trump. So you can understand where they're coming from. They have to stop this man at all costs, and so far, thank goodness, they have not. It's, it's very interesting. I've read in a number of sources, I've, I've kind of gotten mixed, actually kind of mixed information, and maybe yeah. you, can, you can kind of speak to this. You talk about this a little bit in the book. On one hand, um, Trump has been described to me by people who should know as very much a social liberal, right? Other people have said he's the most, I think the Heritage Foundation sees him as the most conservative in terms of policy, yeah. right? More than Reagan, yes. I think. So the, the, there's a mixed bag, and there's yeah. all, but there's also this thread of him being very kind of consistent in his views over yeah. quite some time. Right? Certain things definitely yeah. consistent. I think um, he's evolved on the social issues. I think he has changed. Mm -hmm. um, 
certainly on things like manufacturing in, the, in America and not getting beaten up in trade deals. This is something that you can find old videos of young Trump saying the exact same thing and taking out ads in the New York Times, so on, over decades. So yes, that's consistent. Um, the social liberal, he probably was. He seems to have talked about a change in his attitude that I think is certainly borne out in his own policies as president and his, uh, his rhetoric. Um, what I found interesting when he came out so strongly as pro-life that a right. number of social conservatives they with Hillary Cl <laughs> more, worse, yeah. I think they, they, they still, they came out for Hillary Clinton. I, I can think of a number of women in, po in sort of uh, journalism and, and politics in particular who have, I always were, were struck by as social conservatives, thought they were, and with Hillary Clinton, with her extremely you know, very uh, 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 kind of free-for-all abortion policies, um, they went for Hillary Clinton, even though I thought they were social conservatives with the president or candidate promising to be a very pro-life candidate, which I thought was truly staggering and kind of showed where people really are in terms of what's important to them. Um, but to your question, yeah, he, there is an interesting um, angle that most people don't think of about Donald Trump, and um, it has to do with his own religious upbringing. Okay. His father, Fred, uh, was somebody who was very um, followed, uh, went to the Crusades of Billy Graham, mm -hmm. for example, in New York City. Uh, Donald Trump, I believe, you know, went with him or at least was exposed to this. Uh, he talked about watching Jerry Falwell, even, as a younger man um, growing up, and he... Um, also found for himself, and his parents followed, the church of Norman Vincent Peale in Manhattan, Marble Collegiate, very famous uh, pastor. Uh, most people know him through the power of positive thinking. He was very mm -hmm. famous for this, which was a secular right. kind of project. But I found when I was looking at this um, that Norman Vincent Peale was a very anti, um, outspoken anti-communist back going back to the 30s, 40s, 50s, um, and indeed was pitted against the New Deal, Franklin Roosevelt's very socialist project, and Norman Vincent Peale saw Roosevelt as a very anti-constitutional figure who was seizing powers that did not belong to the president. He got involved in certain bipartisan groups that opposed this through, uh, really through that same period, which is quite interesting. When you take it forward and you realize also that, going back to James Comey, we were talking about Comey's affinity for Reinhold Niebuhr, a contemporary of Norman Vincent Peale. They were at loggerheads themselves. Hmm. Wow. Niebuhr being the more pro-communist person, certainly the anti-anti-communist, as they used to call them. Peel still believing that Christianity had to oppose communism. Uh, uh, Niebuhr actually talked about the need for Christianity to essentially appease communism. I mean, they couldn't have been more different. And then when you realize that in this generation we have Donald Trump, who was very close to Norman Vincent Peel. Uh, he, he hosted his 90th birthday party for him at the Waldorf Astoria. Um, Norman Vincent Peale married Donald Trump with his first, uh, in his first marriage to Ivana. He married his sister. I mean, this was a trump Peel relationship. The New York Times has written about the families mm -hmm. having a bond. And then you see James Comey and his Niebuhr affinity. You see how this ideological battle follows generations. So the red thread is not really only in our own time, sort of, I see it horizontally. I mean, it goes back in the generations. And this cleavage that we're really looking at, whether the players see it that way, I think you can make the case, and I start to see it that way, is essentially the age-old battle between communism and anti-communism, between democratic uh, elected government and dictatorship. And I would argue that these people involved in this, um, I call it a conspiracy, are um, at their essence very dictatorial. I mean, I think it's, it's, the proof is in their pudding. And when you see Trump, the populist, you see that same kind of uh, common touch, trying to do the agenda that he sold to the American people that vo they voted for. I mean, this is, this is really black and white stuff. And I hope that by examining the beliefs of the players involved, that more Americans can start to understand how serious this is and how this really does rise above um, a contemporary political storm. This is really playing for keeps. 
And I think it's that, I think it's that serious. Diana West, a powerful place to finish up. Such a pleasure to have you oh, here. Thank you very much, Jan, a pleasure.